So first, I'd like to thank the organizers for this very wonderful meeting that they've been conducting over the last three years, and for this opportunity to present my results. Uh, so today, I'll talk on epigenetic landscapes and how you can construct these landscapes uh, by modeling gene regulatory networks. I'll sort of explain what these terms are. Um, this work was initially started by Ratan Sharkar, who was an MSc student and is now a PhD student at ISC. Uh, Bibhash is my PhD student, and Buddha Priya Chakrabarti is a collaborator. OK, so what is uh, this epigenetics? So basically, epigenetics is the study of uh, cellular changes that are not controlled by changes in your genetic sequence. Right? So what do I mean by that? <clears throat> so all of us uh, start our life as the single cell you know, fertilized egg, uh, which is what is technically called as a totipotent cell. What that means is that this can divide and differentiate and ultimately form a fully functioning uh, adult animal or whatever. And uh, also it forms the placenta. So this uh, embryo then divides to form these blastocytes. And these are what are called the pluripotent cells in that it can form all the cells of your body, but not the placenta. Uh, so these are also called uh, stem cells. So these are the stem cells that we hear of. And these cells then further divide and differentiate going through many steps. And ultimately, you get this whole range of cells that we know in our body, the nerve, muscle, blood, and so on and so forth, all of which share the same genetic code. So they all have the same genetic information. But they're primed for very different functions. Right? So these perform completely different functions. Uh, completely different genes are active in each of these. Uh, there is different uh, organization of the chromatin. There is different histone modifications depending on what cell you're talking about. So this whole process is sort of described as this epigenetic landscape, and that's what we are interested in. And so there are a lot of, uh, in here, uh, there are a lot of steps that are hidden, sort of. So just to give you an example, uh, this is a complicated chart. I don't want you to read all of it. All I want you to see is that, say, I start from one of these intermediate steps, which is called the multipotent hematopoietic stem cell. And then that divides into two, so that differentiates into two initially, the common myeloid progenitor, the common lymphoid progenitor. And then these again further differentiate through a sequence of steps. And ultimately, you get all the sort of, uh, the, so this forms all the blood and the white blood cell, the red blood cell, the basophil, neutrophil, the eosinophil, all your lymphocytes, and so on. So this stem cell is responsible for all of these final cell types that you see. And similar processes happen across all these other muscle cells and so on. So these are complicated multi-step processes where you start from one uh, stem cell, and you can then differentiate to form any cell in your body. So how do we sort of uh, go about understanding this process? So back, way back in the 1950s, this uh, British biologist called Conrad Waddington, he gave a sort of mental picture of how to think about it, and that's been with us since. He said that, well, let's consider a sequence of hills and valleys. And your stem cell sits at the top of this hill. It rolls down. Every time it comes to a point like this, it has to make a decision whether it goes to this side or to that side. And this sort of bifurcations continue until you reach these end valleys, which each of which of correspond to one particular type of differentiated cell. So this is sort of as the, as the embryo divides further and further until you get an adult human being. So you can think of this as time in some sense. You start from the embryo and you grow to form an adult, adult animal. And that is the direction that the flow goes in. Okay. So, so this picture has been there. Uh, but a lot of, there's been a lot of recent interest in, uh, well, um, so it's not completely deterministic. So there are, of course, uh, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, so this is a very basic hand-waving sort of mental picture. That you start from a stem cell. Then you further differentiate and differentiate until you get these final set cell types. This is not a deterministic process. So there are variations in transcription factors. There are variations in histones and so on. There is, of course, cell noise. And so it's not deterministic. But that is roughly, so top to bottom is roughly the direction of time. Um, so there's been a lot of interest in whether you can go the opposite direction. So if you start from a cell in one of these valleys, so you start from a fully differentiated cell, so you take a muscle cell. Can you make it go back to the stem cell state? So that has been a question that people have been trying to ask for a long time. And fairly recently, in uh, 2006, this Japanese biologist called Yamanaka showed that indeed you can do that. 
So we first did this experiment with mouse fibroblast cells, so some sort of differentiated cell in a mouse. And he put in four transcription factors, which are four proteins, and he waited for a while. And he got back these stem cells, which are called the induced pluripotent cells, to differentiate from the natural pluripotent embryonic stem cells. And he also showed that with, if you implant these induced pluripotent cells inside an embryo, you can actually get fully functioning adult mice. Right? So you can actually get fully functioning adult mice. So everything works, everything seems to work. And then later on, he repeated this experiment for human fibroblast cells. And he showed that the same set of four transcription factors can actually give you human-induced pluripotent stem cells. And then later on, another group uh, showed that another four transcription factors will also do the same thing. Um, so now, instead of having to harvest stem cells from embryos, you can take any cell in your body, and you can make it under the action of these four transcription factors. You can make it go back to the stem cell state. Um, let me just describe one further experiment, because we we'll use it in the modeling. So this was a set of experiments by Nagi and Nagi in Canada. So what they did is that they induced, introduced these four transcription factors into a differentiated cell, and they got what is called as the primary induced pluripotent cell. They put this induced pluripotent cell inside an embryo. They got adult mice. Then they took, this, they took the differentiated cells of this adult mice, which already have these four transcription factors built in, but they're not activated. So they activated it by this chemical doxycycline. And then this secondary fibroblast again form what is the secondary induced pluripotent stem cell. Okay. So now we have this control through one chemical, doxycycline. And what they did was to apply this chemical for different periods of time. So this whole process going from the uh, differentiated cell to the induced pluripotent stem cell takes about three weeks. <coughs> Sorry. So what they showed was that if you apply this doxycycline input for a period which is less than about seven days, nothing happens. You stay in the differentiated cell. If you apply the doxycycline input for more than about 14 days, you get this induced pluripotent stem cells. And in between, there is an area, there is a, from day 9 to day 13, where if you stop your doxycycline input here, it neither comes back to the differentiated state nor does it go to the undifferentiated state. So this was a sort of new state that they called so the properties of this are not very clear, so they called it the area 51 state. Mm -hmm. All right, so now the question is that, so this picture has been there of Waddington's landscape. So may, may I ask one question? Sorry, here. So if we stop there and wait and then again put those factors. So if, you, if you wait for some time and then again put doxycycline. I do not know, frankly, but I would imagine it would go to the induced pluripotent stem cell. That, that's, that's purely a guess. I do not know. So the question is now, having all these experiments and so on, can we put this landscape on a somewhat firmer mathematical footing? And that comes to modeling gene regulatory networks. So the process, or one of the factors that control this uh, differentiation process, is which trans so you have competition between different genes or different transcription factors. And if one transcription factor dominates, you go to one cell fate. If another transcription factor dominates, you go to another cell fate. So can you model these interacting transcription factors and come up with some sort of a landscape? So as with all theory, you start off with a very toy model, which in no way represents reality. So this work was done by Ferrell in 2012, where he said that, well, let me consider a single gene. Uh, and so, well, rather I'm con considering a transcription factor, which activates a single gene. And X represents the concentration of this trans transcription factor. And I write down a differential equation for the rate of change of the concentration of this transcription factor. So this is three very simple terms. One is an input term, so you provide some sort of an input, which I call alpha zero. There is a self, uh, there is a feedback loop, so the more effects you have, the more you produce, and that's modeled through a Hill function. There is nothing special about this term. Any sort of switch-like any sort of switch-like term will give you the same behavior. And finally, you have a decay term, which is minus beta x. If you look at this model, there are two stable steady states, and depending on the value of your input. You can initially be in one, steady, one stable state, and then at some point, you'll go undergo a saddle node bifurcation, and you'll end up in another steady state. So this is sort of the mental analog of a state going from differentiated to undifferentiated and so on. Okay, so this is a very, uh, the very toy model-like picture, but this, is the, this was the starting point of our work. So what we said was that, well, this is nice. Uh, but these uh, processes, they happen over a period of time. 
So it takes 21 days for this process to happen, this reverse differentiation process. And there's a lot of other things that are going on at the same time. Your chromatin is remodeling, different histone proteins become activated and so on. So these take time and therefore these feedback loops should, should probably in principle not be instantaneous feedback, but rather time delayed feedback. Okay. So you wanted to ask the question that what happens if you have a system like this, but now you introduce time delayed feedback. So this is the time delayed feedback term. So this equation is exactly the same as Ferrell's, but we now have a time delayed feedback. And we also have a time dependent chemical drive because we sort of wanted to mimic the Nagi experiment. So this alpha naught now corresponds to the doxycycline input. You provide it for some period of time d and then you switch it off. So that's a heaviside function, right? So what do we see? So what we see is if you provide this input for a very small amount of time, whatever this number is, it's something small compared. So basically it's small compared to the delay time scale tau. Uh, you start off at some state and you stay in that state. Okay. If you provide this input for a very large amount of time, d is now 1000. You start off at one state and you go end up at the other state. Okay. In between, when your D is sort of comparable to the delay time scales, what you see is this long-lived oscillatory states. Where your concent the concentration of the transcription factor sort of oscillates between this, uh, the differentiated, differentiated stable point and non-differentiated stable point. Okay. So this is sort of a new state. And the claim is that probably this is, uh, could be one candidate, I do not know. This could be one candidate for the sort of area 51 states that they see. Um, I have very little time, so I'll go a little bit quickly. So we did the phase diagram of this one-dimensional model, and you can see that for different parameter regimes, you can either have a direct transition from the undifferentiated to the pluripotent state, or you can go through this oscillatory region, which is the area 51. So this, was, this is the reference for this work. So now we wanted to do something a little bit more realistic, and that is to take a two-gene network. So this two-gene motif is something that is very common. It occurs actually in real biological systems. And so the motive is that you have two transcription factors now, x1 and x2. x1 upregulates its own production, x2 upregulates its own production, but they mutually inhibit each other. Okay. So there is a positive feedback term from x1, there is a negative feedback term from x2. And this motive sort of occurs in this initial picture that I showed of the common myeloid progenitor cell that divides into two, the myeloid and the erythroid, depending on two transcription factors. If PU1 dominates, you go to myeloid. If this transcription factor called GATA1 dominates, you go to the erythroid. So this work was done by Wang in 2011, and they constructed a short sort of landscape by constructing the Fokker-Planck equation corresponding to these equations. You solve the Fokker-Planck equation, you get a steady state probability, you take minus log PSS, you get some sort of a landscape. So this is the landscape that is shown here. Um, so what we wanted to ask is, what is the effect if you now have time delays in this two-dimensional uh, gene regulatory network? So this is our model. So again, we have a time-dependent chemical drive. You have these delays. Now we have two delay time scales, one corresponding to x1, one corresponding to x2. So in certain parameter regimes, you get back the oscillatory behavior that was seen in the one-dimensional gene network, so that's good. So here again, for small d, you stay where you were. For intermediate values of d, you have these oscillatory states. And finally, if you increase your d even further, you go to this third state, which now corresponds to the induced pluripotent state. So that is good that this uh, oscillatory state stays on. Do we see something else? And the answer is yes, we do. In some other parameter regimes, there is something very interesting going on. Um, so here, for small values of the drive, everything stays where you were. So here, I think in this, uh, the steady state values are 0 and 1.4. So you start off there, you end up there. Then you sort of increase your drive. You see these oscillatory states, these long-lived oscillatory states. But if you increase your drive even further, then these two states sort of switch. So what started off at zero goes to 1.4. What started off as 1.4 goes to zero. <coughs> so in the language of biology, this would sort of correspond to one differentiated state going to another differentiated state without having to pass through the stem cell state. So this is what is known as trans differentiation, and this is indeed seen in experiments. And again, you can construct the phase diagram for different parameter values. Um, so the question is whether this is you know completely some mathematical artifact or whether this is something that's actually seen. So recently it has been reported that you do actually see oscillations in the concentrations of these transcription factors. And it's not really clear what the role of, these concent of this uh, phase is where you have these concentrations. So this is a mouse neural progenitor cell that's differentiating under the action of these transcription factors. 
and you see a state where you have these uh, sustained oscillations. So that is something that has been seen. And Franz differentiation is actually very well known. So you can, there have been various experiments where you can convert one type of cell to another without transitioning to a pluripotent state. So it appears that if these, uh, these, artifact, these uh, observations that we have because of time delay are actually relevant for biological systems. So the next question which we are still doing, so this is ongoing work, is whether now you can construct a landscape similar to Wang. And for that, you have to do delay Fokker Planck equations. So you have a stochastic uh, equation with delays, and these are highly nonlinear because of these feedback terms. So it's slightly difficult. We are still trying, but hopefully by the next meeting, we'll have some results to show you. So I'd just like to conclude that when you're modeling gene regulatory networks, presumably delayed loops are important, delayed feedback loops. An interplay of drive and delay can result in new oscillatory states. In two gene networks, you, are, you have this process of trans differentiation, which has been seen biologically. And then ideally, one would like to look at real biological networks and see what are the implications of such sort of delayed feedback. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Showed this Hill's equation, mm -hmm. and uh, you had some time dependent. Uh, so, I mean, what happens? I mean, is, do you see any kind of hysteresis? Suppose. Uh, so, this sort of equation. No, the next. Huh, this equation, but uh, can you go in the next? Yeah, this one. Okay. So, I mean, this is bistable. Yes. Right? So, now if you come back in time, mm -hmm. what may happen? I mean, uh, do you the see The thing is so? that we have, so what we have looked I mean, at uh, is... Biologically, it may not be relevant. No, so <laughs> I, just, I don't know if this answers your question. So what we have looked at is we have started from the differentiated minima, whatever we are calling as a differentiated state, and we go try to go up to the this stem cell state, and there you see these sustained oscillations. If you're going in the reverse direction, you do not actually see these sustained oscillations. So there you either are in the, in one state or the other. Somewhat trapped in the middle mm -hmm. uh, in the experiment, mm -hmm. but from theory we see an oscillatory phase. Ah, so there they had not. I, I do not think they had measured the concentrations of these transcription factors. So, so that's the claim basically that if you now go back and repeat that experiment and you measure the concentrations of the relevant transcription factors, whether you see oscillations or not. So that is so either you do, in which case this is good. Otherwise, you have to throw this away. I, I do not. Think. Let's thank again and invite the next speaker. Thank you.